So we're looking at the deep sea. Um, and for a long time, people didn't think that life could actually exist in this area of the ocean. So people used to think that you only had life like in the top little bit of the water. And then below that, it was just black water, nothing existed. Um, because one of the, the characteristics of this area of the ocean is that there is no primary productivity, right? And everything that we've looked at so far, every ecosystem that we've looked at, um, everything starts off with the primary producers, right? So how do you have animals that live in a place where there's like no food source? Uh, and so nobody thought that they could exist. But we know now that there are things that live in the deep ocean. And in fact, there's lots of things that live down here. It's kind of crazy. So this cycle, we're gonna be looking at two pelagic regions um, or the water column uh, below the epipelagic zone before the um, the seafloor. Next cycle, we'll actually look at like what lives on the seafloor and around the hydrothermal vents and stuff like that. But this cycle, we are looking at the water column. So the past time we were looking at the epipelagic zone, that's the top 200 meters of water. Okay, that's about 660 feet. Below that, we have the deep ocean, and we can divide that into a bunch of different kind of zones. We're basically going to divide it into two, and then use those terms to refer to these areas for the next couple cycles, okay? So the first one that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about is the mesopelagic zone. That's just underneath the epipelagic zone. That's between 200 and 1,000 meters, okay? So that's like 660 feet to 3,300 feet, okay? And then below that, okay, is going to be the deep sea. So we're gonna say mesopelagic zone and then deep sea. Uh, you can divide this into like basal, abyssal, and hadoplagic. We're just going to refer to it as the deep sea. Okay. So this is what we'll look at this cycle. All right. <coughs> so this is a very different ecosystem than any that we've ever looked at before uh, because there are no primary producers. They, there, this is the aphotic zone. Below 200 meters, there's not enough light for photosynthesis to occur. So you do not have any primary producers, uh, which means that any animals that live here, because you do have animals that live here, they depend on food that falls from the surface. So all of that stuff that we talked about last cycle, the marine snow, right? The cobwebby aggregates of mucus that, has, that have like bacteria and particular organic matter stuck to it and then those like sink down. That is the, uh, that is one of the main sources of food for this area of the ocean, okay? Is all of that like cobwebby nastiness, okay? That's the source of food. So things that live down here in the deep sea and in the mesopelagic zone, their food source is the marine snow and then um, any sort of other food that might fall from above, all right? so. Even though they're living down here where there's no light, they still kind of, by proxy, depend on the things that, the primary producers that are in the surface waters. This is whatever falls down is what they eat. Um, so that's one of the characteristics of the, this area of the ocean is the lack of primary product productivity. And then the other thing that is in rare, or is very rare in these areas is oxygen. So if you don't have primary producers, that are doing photosynthesis, you're not gonna have a lot of oxygen in the water, right? Because one of the products of primary productivity or photosynthesis is oxygen. So the surface waters have all of this like phytoplankton doing photosynthesis. They're releasing oxygen into the water. So the top layer of water has lots of oxygen in it. Um, also, it's at the surface. And so it has contact with the atmosphere, right? The top of the water has contact with the atmosphere. And when you get like waves crashing, you get little bubbles that form in the water, which helps to dissolve oxygen into the water as well. As you go down um, below this top layer, there's no contact with the surface. So you're not getting like oxygen dissolving into the water from the atmosphere. And you're also not getting primary productivity. So there's less oxygen down here. The things that live here are animals. So they do need oxygen because they're going to do cellular respiration. And you need oxygen to perform cellular respiration. Um, and so there has to be some way that they can get oxygen down to these depths. So let's look at how they actually do that. Okay, so if the oceans were entirely stagnant, 
um, and like no, you had like no water movement, life could not exist in the deep sea because you could not get oxygen down to these depths. Um, however, lucky for us and for the animals that live down here, the ocean is not stagnant. There are currents that even deep water currents that run along the very bottom of the sea floor of the abyssal plain, thousands of feet in the water. Um, and those currents are actually formed uh, by, not by wind, but by salinity and temperature differences in water, okay? by density differences. Do you remember when we talked about density last semester? We talked about how temperature and salinity affect the density of water, yeah? So if you have lot, uh, very cold, salty water on top of less salty, warmer water, what's going to happen to that? Yeah, so that deep water, or the cold, salty water is going to sink below the warmer, less salty water because it is more dense, right? So what happens is in certain areas on Earth, uh, you get water that gets really cold really fast, ocean water that gets really cold really fast. Um, and because it gets so cold so quickly, it becomes more dense than the water that's below it, and it sinks, right? And it actually becomes so cold that it becomes dense enough to sink all the way down to the sea floor. So it sinks all the way down to the sea floor. That water, because it was at the surface, had lots of oxygen in it. When it sinks, it takes that oxygen with it, okay? And as it sinks down, brings oxygen down to the deep ocean. Um, and then hits the bottom, okay? And then that water spreads out and actually creates this current underneath the water, okay? And so it moves along and delivers oxygen to the animals that are living down in the deep sea, eventually gets in the tropical regions, gets forced up by seamounts, gets warmed back up and rises back to the surface, travels along the surface, back to the poles, gets cold again, sinks back down. And you get these big like currents that form entirely driven by the density differences of water, which is kind of cool. So it's this whole process is called thermohaline circulation. Thermohaline, thermo temperature, haline salinity. So it's entirely driven by the, t the temperature and salinity differences in water. Um, it's not driven by wind. Remember when we talked about gyres and stuff like that? We, it was like the wind blowing on the surface of the water, and the wind actually got those big currents started. These are not driven by wind. These are driven by density differences. Uh, the places where you get that deep water actually forming, where it gets uh, where it gets cold enough to sink to the bottom, you're going to have the, in the North Atlantic, in the Norwegian Sea, and also by Greenland, and then in the South Atlantic, next to Antarctica, in the Weddell Sea. Okay, those are where you're going to get lots and lots of or cold water forming at the poles. Where you get that deep water coming back up to the surface is going to be in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And I will show you a picture. Uh, let's look at this one. Okay, so this is what happens. Uh, the these areas right here, here's the Norwegian Sea, okay, here's by Greenland, and then here's the Weddell Sea. So these are the areas where you're going to get super cold water, it's going to sink down, and then these blue lines represent the deep water current. So up here where the water sinks, it goes all the way down to the bottom, travels along the bottom, um, down towards the South Atlantic, it moves up towards the Indian Ocean, and then gets forced back up to the surface, warms back up, rises, Okay, travels along the red lines, which are the surface currents, back to the poles where it gets cold again and sinks back down. So this whole big current, okay, um, this is called the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. Okay, that's what the, they call this current. Um, <coughs> this is not like a fast-moving current. This would actually take hundreds of years for water to like sink and move along and then rise back up and go back to where it started. So it's not like a rushing river underwater, but it's enough that the animals that live in the deep sea get the oxygen that they need to survive. And one of many of the adaptations that animals in the deep sea have for uh, living down there is for like lack of oxygen. So they're very sedentary, they don't move around a lot. Um, 
so that they don't use up a lot of oxygen. So that's one of the adaptations that they have. Uh, <clears throat> um, so here's why I get excited about this, why I think this is really cool. Because I actually think this is crazy. Uh, so remember last semester when we talked about like the polarity of water and like how water is a polar molecule and that causes hydrogen bonds to be formed and then we talked about like how that affects the density of water. Like all of those small things that you think are insignificant all kind of come together and like in perfect harmony to create this property of water where it becomes more dense as it gets colder, causing it to sink, causing it to bring oxygen to the deep sea so that things can survive down here. That's crazy to me. Just the intricacies um, of all of the ecosystems of the ocean and even just the molecules of water and how they all interplay together is astounding. It's so cool. So I get excited about this. Um, the mesopelagic zone is the first zone that we're going to look at. And in the mesopelagic zone, that occurs from about 660 feet to about 3,300 feet or uh, 200 meters down to 1,000 meters. Okay, at this zone right here, um, that zone, the mesopelagic zone, is called the twilight zone. Right? Yeah, because um, at the top of the mesopelagic zone, there is actually still light. Okay, there's enough light that you could probably read a newspaper. Okay, but there's not enough light for photosynthesis to occur at this point. So you could probably read a newspaper, but not enough light for photosynthesis. After that, after the surface or top part of the mesopelagic zone, um, as you go deeper, light, the amount of light rapidly drops off. Okay, until you get to the bottom of the mesopelagic zone where there is no light whatsoever. So how many of you have ever been on a like in a cave or something like that and they turn out all the lights and it's like so dark you could put your hand like right here in front of your face and not even like see anything? That's what it's like down here. There is no light. Okay, we're, it's kind of hard for us to imagine um, because we're so used to like sunlight and being able to see, or like even if it's dark outside, you've got like the moon or the stars or something, a little light on your phone, okay, flashing, something like that. Okay, so we're not used to just complete, utter, total darkness. That's that's what this is down here. Okay, just complete blackness. If there is any light, it is created by the animals that live there. There is no sunlight. Um, one of the unique features of this mesopelagic zone is the main thermocline of the ocean occurs here. So this is where um, that, that thermocline occurs, where you get that rapid change in temperature with depth, acts as a barrier, traps nutrients in the deep sea. That all happens here in the mesopelagic zone. So those animals that do migrate, they if they're living down here during the day and then migrating up at night, as they move through this area, they will be experiencing rapid temperature changes. So let's look at a picture to help you see this. So this top part right here, that's the epiplagic zone. Um, and then this over here on the left, that represents the depth. And then this is the temperature along the bottom. Okay. In the epiplagic zone, the temperature is pretty much constant. It's pretty warm. It's warm by the sun, well mixed by currents and stuff. So that temperature is about 14 degrees Celsius, okay? Uh, once you hit about 200 meters, top of the mesopelagic zone, down to 1,000 meters, look at what happens to the temperature. It goes from 14 degrees Celsius and drops down to 4 degrees Celsius in about 800 meters. So that's like 40 degrees Fahrenheit that it changes. So in just 800 meters of water. So it's a rapid change in temperature with depth. So if you're an animal that's living here and you've got to migrate up to here, you're going to be experiencing big temperature changes. Um, and you'll have to be able to deal with that. Below the mesopelagic zone, the temperature of the water is pretty much constantly freezing. Okay, it's about four degrees Celsius. So it is super, super, super cold down here. Okay, no sunlight, super cold, lots of pressure. It's a harsh environment. All right? So that's where the main thermocline occurred. So even though we don't have primary producers, we do have animals. And you'll hear the term midwater, midwater animal. Um, 
so if you hear mesoplagic midwater, that's the same thing. All right. In this zone, you do have kind of like the same groupings of animals that you find in the epipelagic. So you're still going to have krill and copepods that make up the majority of the plankton, the zooplankton. But they're going to look a little bit different because they're in a different habitat, different environment. Okay, so they'll have the same groupings, but they'll just look a little bit different. Some of these will also um, have these things called photophores, which are light producing organs. So, so many animals in the mesopelagic zone produce light in a process called bioluminescence. Um, and we'll talk more about why they actually do that because it's, it's pretty cool why they do that. Um, one of the things you'll find down here are ostracods. They're basically crustaceans that look like clams with legs. Here's what an ostracod looks like. Other things that you'll find, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, jellyfish, so you do have jellyfish that live down here. But again, they're going to look different because they're in a different environment. But actually, jellyfish can be pretty brightly colored down here in the mesoplagic and the deep sea. Um, comb jellies. We, th we saw these in the open ocean video that you watched, right? So these are some of the things that are going to be migrating from the mesoplagic zone up to the epiplagic. Siphonophores, those are going to be things like Portuguese man of war, but a little bit different in the deep sea and the mesoplagic. You have squid that live down here, but again, going to be a little bit different. Um, kind of weird looking, actually. So you can see this guy here on the left, right? That would be more of like a deep sea kind of squid um, or a mesoplagic squid. And then this is the vampire squid. How big do you think that squid is? It's about this big. It's like two inches, okay? So at like, yeah, it looks like it might be bigger because of the picture, but um, they're actually super, super small. It's called vampire squid because in between those arms, they've got like a membrane um, and they can actually use that as kind of like a cloak and they'll like fold their arms back over their body and like hide their body with this like cloak thing. Like the old vampire movies, right, with the cape where they're like, I'm going to eat you, like sort of thing. <laughs> All right. You also have fish. You have fish that live in this area of the ocean. The fish, though, are strange looking. They're very strange looking. The fish are also small. We'll talk more about this, but um, the fish in the mesoplagic and deep sea pelagic regions of the ocean tend to be small. So they average between one and four inches. That's their average. Okay, so between one right, and like four inches, that's their average. Uh, you do have some that will be larger than that, but for the most part, the things that live here are small, mostly because of the lack of food, right? It takes a lot of food to get big and strong, and so if there's not as much food, then you can't get as big, right? So things that live here, especially fish, are going to be small. Uh, bristle mouths and lantern fish are the two most common things that we, common types of fish that we pull up from the mesopelagic zone. This is a bristle mouth, so that's like a close-up of its face. You can see it. This is what its body looks like. Okay, kind of creepy looking. These are lantern fish. Okay, so you can see them. Um, they, these guys actually can form schools in the mesoplagic zone, so that's what that picture is. Um, but those are like small little fish, not very big. Other types of fish that you'll find here hatchet fish, viper fish, dragon fish, snake mackerel, lancet fish, lots of things. Um, what do you notice about all of those names? Fish. They're not all fish. Fish, okay. <laughs> Any common theme that you see? Teeth. Uh, Teeth, okay. They, they sound vicious. They sound vicious, yeah. They all have like these big scary names like the dragonfish or the viperfish. Uh, and the reason why many of these actually have uh, these scary looking sounding names is because one of the adaptations for living down in these areas is having these big old teeth. 
So many of them have huge, huge, huge teeth compared to their body size. However, most of them are like super small. So compared to their body size, they have huge teeth um, and they look scary to us. So we give them all these kind of like scary sounding names, but they're not gonna be able to eat you because they're like teeny, teeny, tiny little fish. Uh, the viper fish right here, can you see its teeth? It's kind of hidden, can you see its teeth there? Uh, actually the viper fish, if the viper fish were to close its mouth all the way, it would actually puncture its own brain with its teeth. So that's, it doesn't close its mouth all the way, clearly. So here's a, how many of you saw a Nemo anglerfish, right? The one, the scary one? Yeah, the little light. These are anglerfish. Uh, notice that's in a person's hand. Okay. And there's another one down there. So most anglerfish are going to be about this size. You do have some species that will get a little bit bigger, okay? But that's more rare. But they're mostly going to be this size. <laughs> they're, they're little, yeah. So these are more deep sea anglerfish um, because of their coloration and their eyes and stuff. But yeah, a little bit disappointing, huh? Another re another way that Nemo lied to you. Here's pictures of some of these fish. So this this is the hatchet fish, dragonfish, snake mackerel. This is going to be one that's bigger. Okay. Uh, here's the saber tooth fish. So notice that's in between people's fingers. So those are little fish. Um, this is a big fish. This is a lancet fish. This guy is a fat swimming guy and is a good good is a dominant predator down here. Um, one of, kind of one of the good things about tsunami is that uh, we actually get a bunch of things that we don't ever see washed up on shore after right. tsunami, maybe. But like the lancet fish and other fish like that actually get washed up on shore a lot of times. 